don't know about you, but I do everything I can to get around spanning tree in my network designs. I'll use chassis switches or VSS or stackable switches outside the data center. And inside the data center, I'm going to use virtual port channels. It's, it's a concept we're going to be talking about later on in the Encore blueprint. But unfortunately, even in those scenarios, we are still running spanning tree underneath the topology that we've built. So it might be one logical link between two logical switches, even if it's multiple switches and multiple links bundled together or what have you. But we're still running spanning tree across that because just in case there's a loop, we have to have spanning tree enabled. Well, inside the data center, again, even if we do everything we can to eliminate it, we're going to be running spanning tree on some level. And therefore, we need to know how spanning tree functions so that we can fine tune spanning tree in those cases that we need to rely on it or otherwise troubleshoot it if something is wrong. So by the end of this video, you will be able to describe traditional 802.1D spanning tree protocol. If you're studying for a professional level certification, then you've probably heard this story a thousand times. When we have a network loop, that creates broadcast storms. Broadcast packets and ethernet travel infinitely, and so they will never cease to exist inside of a network loop until a switch becomes so overloaded that it drops all of the broadcast traffic along with the actual network traffic that we care about. And so spanning tree to the rescue, right? Spanning tree comes in and it blocks one of those links. And so we get the best of both worlds in theory, right? Because number one, the loop is prevented. We no longer need to worry about that. And number two, we still have a redundant path upstream just in case the other path goes down. And this is great and all except the traditional 802.1D implementation of spanning tree protocol, while effective in blocking loops, is known as being extremely slow. It can take between 30 and 50 seconds to converge. And this is why we've moved on to rapid and multi-instance spanning tree because we're trying to get rid of this lengthy convergence time in modern networks. We want to get that below a second, which we can do with those protocols. But in order to understand those faster protocols, we still need to understand 802.1D. And so that's what we're going to explore in this video. First and foremost, Cisco's deployment of traditional spanning tree takes effect via the per VLAN spanning tree plus protocol, PVST plus as we call it. Now in a PVST plus environment, we are going to elect a root switch or root bridge as we like to call them in a spanning tree world. The root bridge is elected by lowest bridge ID and the bridge ID is a concatenation of a priority value plus the MAC address of the bridge itself. And by the way, if you haven't heard this, bridge is another word for switch. So switch, bridge, we just kind of think of them as the same thing. That's why we get bridge IDs for these various switches. Now this root switch is going to generate something we call bridge protocol data units or BPDUs. And these BPDUs are going to be flooded out all ports in the network. Switches that receive that BPU are going to process the BPDU first and foremost, and then it's going to push that BPDU further down the network. And so we're going to get that from both sides here where we're pushing BPDUs now at each other. Now when a switch receives a BPDU, it's going to determine if that is the best port to reach the root. And we're going to call those ports root ports. So in our diagram here, the root ports are going to be these interfaces that directly face the root switch. Now root ports are never blocked because they are the fastest path to the root switch. Then what we're going to do is we're going to designate the other ports on our switch as designated ports. And when we have two designated ports on the same link, that tells us that we're going to need to block one of these interfaces. So how do we determine which end to block? Well, it's going to come down to three factors. First of all, we're going to compare the cost to the roots. Cost is a measure of how far away the root bridge is. And so if I'm closer to the root switch, then I will not block my port. You will block your port. Now, in a lot of cases, if all links are created equal and all costs are calculated by default in our little triangle network here, the costs are going to be the same. And so we need a tiebreaker. And that tiebreaker is going to be the bridge ID. And the bridge ID, as we mentioned, is a priority value that we configure on the switch plus the MAC address. And because MAC addresses are, in theory, unique in the network, well, even if the priorities are the same, the MAC addresses should be different, and therefore we should never see the same bridge ID on two different switches. Now, there is a scenario where we can tie here, even though the bridge IDs are unique. Number one, we could have a switch that has a port looped to itself. At that point, we need to figure out which end of the link to block. But back when we used traditional spanning tree, we also had to worry about this concept of a hub. And so if we had a hub connected to the switch in two different links, and we had users hanging off of that hub, well, we do want to figure out which link we should block. And so we're going to block one of those links so that all of those users have redundant yet loop-free access to the rest of the network. And so in that scenario, we are going to leverage the port ID. Port ID is going to look very similar to the bridge ID in that we have a configurable priority value, and then we add on to it the port number in order to get a unique value. Incidentally, these three tiebreakers are not only used to figure out which designated port I should block, 
but it's also used to figure out which port should be my root port. Because as we saw in this scenario, I'm getting BPDUs from both sides. And we can look at this diagram and say, well, okay, that root port should be on the left because that's where the root switch is. But the switch doesn't see that. So we need to figure out how am I going to determine which port should be my root port. And first and foremost, I'm going to look at the cost of the root, which in our scenario pretty well establishes that, yeah, we're going to go out the left side. But then we can look at the upstream bridge IDs and the port IDs if indeed we need to go that far in order to figure out which port I should pick for my root port. Now with Cisco, we have this concept of per VLAN spanning tree plus that says that we're going to build this type of topology for every single VLAN in the network. Because if I look at this and say, well, wait a second, if I block this link and this link was expensive for me to build, well, I mean, yeah, I need the redundancy, but I also have to block the link and those are two really bad choices. I don't want either one of those. Well, PVST says that I can build a topology per VLAN. And so maybe for VLAN one, I block the port on the right as we saw, but for VLAN two, I'm going to block the port on the left. And I can do that by electing a different root bridge for that VLAN. And as we can see here, even though we're blocking ports on both VLANs, we're actually sending traffic out both of those physical interfaces now. And that's the advantage of having a per VLAN spanning tree topology. Now it comes to spanning tree, we talk a lot about these timers. We have the hello timer, that would be two seconds by default. We have the forwarding delay, that would be 15 seconds by default. And then we also have max age. And max age is 20 seconds by default. Now when we bring up a new port, we do two times the forwarding delay in order to bring up an interface because we have to go through these different states in spanning tree, such as listening and learning states. And so that ends up being 30 seconds that it takes to bring a port online. I mean, that is a long time. Once I plug a device in to wait 30 seconds to have network access, that's not really the best scenario. And then sometimes we have to worry about max age. Max age helps us detect indirect link failures. And so it might take us 20 seconds to detect that there's a failure. And then we have to go through this process to bring up a new link. So another 30 seconds, well, holy smokes, that could be 50 seconds that it takes for us to recover from an outage. So Cisco did what they could with traditional spanning tree and created some enhancements in order to speed this process up. These are enhancements such as uplink fast and backbone fast. And probably the one we're most familiar with is port fast. These three enhancements were designed to speed up the spanning tree process so we didn't necessarily have to wait 30 and 50 seconds in order to get network access in different scenarios. However, these are really just bandages to patch over some problems that really needed to be fixed and addressed within the spanning tree world. And this is where rapid spanning tree comes into play. And we're going to be covering that in the next video. And with that, you're now able to describe traditional 802.1D spanning tree protocol. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing.